Hey, good morning, everyone in American History One. Uh, I'm a Chapter 11, the Cotton Revolution, and should also be talking about the um, institutionalization and expansion of slavery during that during this era. I'm trying to capture an era really from 1820 right up into the eve of the Civil War, 1860, and it's talking uh, specifically. Uh, well, through the whole United States, but it's talking a lot about the South and what the South's ideology was about slavery and about how it was the economic engine related to the explosion of the cotton industry. Why? Well, initially, we did have some cotton growth in the islands off of South Carolina. It was a certain type of um, strain of cotton. There's different kinds of cotton plants. Uh, but it was really the advent of something called petite gulf cotton, um, which was more easily grown. It was a, a hardy crop, if you will. It produced good cotton. Problem is, it also produced a cotton with a very thick and sort of um, attached seed, if you will. It was difficult to pull the seed out, if you've ever heard that phrase. You know, wait a cotton pick, pick and minute. It's a, you're, you're, you're picking these seeds out of the actual uh, uh, weave of the cotton. It was very difficult by hand, so it wasn't very economically viable. What changed was the Eli's cotton gin. It's not just Eli gets all the credit because he's probably the first successful patented mechanized machinery that took seeds out of the cotton um, fibers um, with a great deal of success, making basically the harvesting of cotton very profitable. But it's still very labor intensive. Who's going to do that labor? Slaves. This is what really starts getting the sectionalization of our nation, nation even more strongly distinct because we don't have cotton basically north of the slave states. The slave states need slavery pre previously for the cotton, uh, the tobacco industry. Tobacco is not dying, but tobacco is not nearly as profitable as once was. It's very difficult to grow. It's exhaustive of the soil. You might have a huge farm. The land gets depleted in four or five years. It becomes useless to growing tobacco. You have to sell and buy more and move. It, it, cotton is more of a viable crop year in and year out on the same properties and it doesn't exhaust the soil in the same way. But again, we didn't have this combination of petite gulf cotton planted, we finally did, coupled with the, the Eli cotton gin and other cotton gins. Eli Whitney gets all the credit, but there were other manufacturers coming out with processes to move the seed from the cotton. And it's a massive boon if you, if you look at the statistical information, the book does a really nice job on this, about how cotton started off um, in 1793, uh, there was 5 million pounds of cotton, 5 million pounds of cotton in 1793. By 1835, there were more than 500 million pounds of petite gulf comp, uh, cotton that were shipped out to uh, London, Liverpool, Paris, Europe. Uh, it's amazing the growth of it, and it's because of slave labor and Eli's cotton gin. But it's also another part of a negative, if you will, part of history was the Native, well, I keep calling it Native American, I'm trying to sound politically correct, but it was the, it's called the Indian Removal Act of the 1830s. And basically lands in Georgia and other lands that were um, ripe for growing cotton were occupied by Native Americans. And so the government removed them under the uh, Indian Removal Act, set them up on reservations west of the Mississippi River and lands that were basically at that juncture useless to, to, to white people. Well, so now these lands become available. These huge farms start going. The profits are staggering. The South is thriving financially. But don't, yeah, you know, sometimes as, you know, as a Northerner myself, I like to think, hey, we're not part of this whole slave culture, but we still benefited from it economically. Who do you think was doing a lot of the financing? People in the Northeast. Who was doing a lot of the textile work with the cotton uh, that was actually processed in the United States? The Northeast. And so it was it impacted the slave industry was on the cusp of every economic aspect of American success during this time, maybe even, maybe even globally. But the importation of slaves ended. Slave value became very high during this period of time. There's a huge demand for slaves. But we know in 1808, we banned the importation of future slaves. It's not because we didn't the South didn't want more slaves, but slaves were self-propagating. What do we mean by self-propagating? Slaves would have families and have their own kids and their kids would be born into slavery. So the slavery population just grew through national, national uh, 
natural processes. The North ended slavery largely most of the time. I mean, New Jersey had some slavery right up until the Civil War. But in terms of significant numbers, slavery was ending in the Northeast and upper Midwest, um, really right after the Revolutionary War. It just wasn't economically viable. So philosophically, it became easier for people in the Northeast to vilify the South um, for having such an evil institution. So these sectional rivalries and questions over state rights versus federal centralized power uses the you know the, the vehicle of slavery to, to really create a lot of animosity between these regional sections of the country. But slavery was huge. And some of the famous terms that we think about to this day actually born out of the, the, the slave industry. Slaves became very, very valuable. Part of a, the economy itself wasn't just the trading and selling of cotton. It was also the trading and selling of human beings, slaves. And because they were no longer viable in the more northern regions, those that were up in the northern regions were often sold literally downriver. That was one of the main means of travel in the earlier part of the 19th century was through through riverway, riverways. So northern slaves would be sold down the river. If you ever heard that saying, hey, I got sold down the river, that was in relationship to slaves being sold to a more southern region where they were more heavily needed. And we know the institution of, of slavery became much more harsh during this period of time. One is because of the Haitian Revolution. It really put the fear of potential revolt in the minds of Southern whites, especially when the slave population was in some communities almost equal to the white population. An uprising was often very fearful. So how do you avoid an uprising? Philosophically, some of them viewed to have brutality much greater than one would imagine in terms of controlling the African slave existence. So nobody would ever even, you know, minor infractions would require to be whipped or punished, or even if, if there's an indication of potential revolt, you could be killed. And then there was one main uh, large revolt. I'm surprised no one's doing a paper on it because a lot of people like to do papers on this. It's the, the Nate Turner revolt. It's 1835 year. Was it ex exactly when the Nate Turner revolt? I should know it by heart. But this revolt was fairly significant in that uh, initially it was six um, slaves, uh, um, uh, basically in 1831, uh, Nate Turner and six slaves eventually ended up becoming 50 slaves. They went to these neighboring farms. They ended up killing um, uh, 57 white men, women, and children on 11 different farms uh, down in Virginia um, were basically killed by these slaves. All of the rebellious slaves were killed. Nate Turner was found a few weeks later. He was hiding in, in, in the forest for a period of time. He was found and he was also executed. But so were a lot of others that were, how could I say it, just simply thought of as potential rabble rousers in the future. So slavery became much more even, much more um, brutalized by the fear of potential um revolt. And the other was this concept that because Africans in this racially um, prejudicial and bigoted view that the black race and the white race could never coexist in some kind of civil society, that slavery actually put in some kind of institutional structure for blacks because they wouldn't be able to live without basically being controlled by the whites. They wouldn't be able to have their own communities. They wouldn't be able to have their own economies. They wouldn't be able to behave. And it would just create chaos and utter demise for the blacks if they weren't put in the institution of slavery and they were meant for that. And part of the religious revival in the South actually brought on that sort of um, philosophical view that the Bible suggested to some of these Southern religious leaders that it was sort of a Christian concept to have some people in put in bondage and in slavery, and it was their duty to treat them with a certain degree of dignity as under Christian values. Um, but nonetheless, that that that's what God predestined these people for was a, was a form of indentured servitude, a form of slavery. It, it really it got into the psyche of the Southern view. In a different book I once read, it said it was as much harmful psychologically to the. Uh, African Americans that were in bondage as much as to the whites that were putting them in bondage because crazy this psychological warped sense of societal structure and and righteousness that was so out of touch with logic and and morality, but it was was ingrained in the South and it was really, really significant. If you read the writings of people in that era, it was really quite shocking.
but you, you know, you should know these little, I don't call them trivial, but we know 1808, there's no more importation of slaves. It's not really that. There is some that's illegal, of course. There's always smuggling. But the slave population grows by natural propagation. If you're a slave and you have a child, your child is also a slave. We know that freed slaves are not welcome in the South in most communities because it gives what? People who are in bondage the belief in the view that they could also reap the benefits of what it's like to be treated as a human being and have humanitarian rights to be a citizen. So many of the freed slaves had to depart from the South or be re, uh, recaptured into a form of slavery and or punished in some fashion for being that era. in that era. We know tobacco dies out, very expensive to grow. Um, it used slave labor significantly, but farmers started switching their crops from tobacco to cotton, much more uh, financially beneficial. And cotton, the cotton, the entire king cotton, that's what they even talked about in Congress. Cotton is king. It's really fueled the entire economy of the United States. In fact, I think it was something like 60% of all of our exports uh, at, on the eve of the Civil War was cotton. Um, but it was so intertwined and attached and part of slavery that you can't separate really the two. Um, you know, they talk about the exponential value of slaves that went up during this era. It was quite large. Um, and the tensions that are going to start to grow, I wish it was kind of related to some chapter, as Western areas of a part of the Louisiana Purchase came in 1803, are these going to be slave states or are going to be free states? Now, if you want to be a cotton grower, you can get really cheap land because the government sees the land from the Indians and selling it to white people that really very low price we call it speculation some people buy it for like literally a couple bucks an acre they sell it for a few days later for huge profits or they start becoming cotton farmers and not everyone was successful they were boon and bust but um the concern was as our country spreads west with manifest destiny which i believe is the next chapter there's those who want to expand slavery into those regions so they can move there and follow the southern tradition of agrarian success with slaves as the labor engine for it and there's those in the north that say no 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 more expansion of slavery they weren't necessarily demanding the end of slavery some were william lord garrison right up here in massachusetts certainly was they wanted he wanted equal rights for african americans right from the inception but others just didn't want the expansion of it because it wasn't only the expansion of the institution it would be expansion of southern power because when a southern state comes in as a slave state they get two more senators in the united states senate and they get more representation in the house of representatives and because regionally the philosophy and the goals and the interest over tariffs and taxation and over monetary planning were very different between the north and the south and so as southern expansion grew how were these new territories going to come into our nation's fold as free or as slave and we know there's three major or maybe four really we have one is the um, Compromise of 1820, which basically allowed Missouri to come in as a slave state as long as Maine came in as a free state. Therefore, you balance the amount of legislative power. And the second is all future states south of the um, southern border of Missouri would come in as uh, slave states, and those north of it would come in as free states. That lasted until 1850. Then we have the second Compromise, 1850. And that is that basically um, it's really a continuation of the Missouri Compromise, uh, but that gets dissolved very quickly with the um, Kansas-Nebraska Act because the Nebraska territory is a very vast area. It becomes two states ultimately. And they say, let's just do popular sovereignty. Let's let the people decide that are selling the states. And people would come in that were abolitionists, people that are coming pro-slavery. They would come in and fight to, to create a government and a legislature that was responsive either pro-slavery or anti-slavery and it was actually a bloodbath and especially kansas bloody kansas they called it but i'm way off track that's really not in this chapter but i thought it was kind of interesting how all these things related and we know ultimately dred scott says basically slaves are property they can be taken anywhere in the united states and that really some people say is the, the straw that broke the camel black back in terms of uh, the conflicts between the regions uh yeah, it says much of pro-slavery ideology rested on the notion that slavery provided a sense of order, duty, and legitimacy to the lives of individual slaves. 
feelings that Africans and African Americans, it was said, could not otherwise experience. They wouldn't even be able to, 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 to live well. They would perish on this planet, at least on the, in, in, in the northern um, continent of the United States, if it wasn't for slavery. These arguments actually existed during this time that slavery was benefiting the Africans. Let's hope that none of us believe that anymore, but it was believed during that period of time, especially in the southern regions. And it became such a part of the philosophy that anytime anybody talked of ending slavery, it really had such a visceral negative reaction that it often came to almost war. And it did eventually, 1860. And we know because it's a capitalist system, the more cotton we can produce, the more profit you make, the more stability you make for your family. So what's your... It's like, not like you're turning the machines on 24-7 and giving your laborers more money. You're pushing the slaves even harder and harder and harder to be productive. And therefore, it becomes even more brutalized. And there's less and less humanity, if there is any humanity in slavery at all. Um, we know it, sometimes we read a lot of books that the South stays extremely agrarian. Much of it is agrarian, but there are cities and there is a cosmopolitan aspect to southern cities. New Orleans, all the coastal cities along the south coast from Virginia down uh, into Georgia. These are fairly cosmopolitan and they are fairly modern, but they never really get the same degree of infrastructure as the north does. But to, to suggest it's like really backwoodsy or back farming and it's just all agrarian there's no mechanism or modernization is complete nonsense they, they they were advancing quite rapidly but because what they were advancing in was the field of agrarianism of agriculture uh, they didn't have the modern sort of uh, commercial concentration that the north experienced in the south yeah, urbanization in the South simply took on a different form. It was seen differently than in the North and in Europe, but there was urbanization in the South as well, especially along the, the coastal regions and in the port cities. Um, and this is the amazing uh, statistics. Sometimes just to put like a, trying to think of the, the number, 4 million, 4 million enslaved people by 1860, accounting or uh, amounting to nearly one third of the entire southern population, one third of the entire southern population were enslaved African Americans. Just shocking. And they talk about slave lives in the book, how they you know thrived to have families and they 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 loved each other and they had kids and they had spouses and they had religion and they had culture and they communication and they tried to well they tried to live with humanity. One of the interesting things is, imagine trying to create that little nucleus family, but what could happen to you? And it did sometimes, say, say you have a, 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 a Southern plantation farmer and he dies and his wife no longer, you know, she no longer take what, what is she gonna do with her slaves? She sells them, and if you can't sell them as a, as a unit, what happens to families? There's no rights to keep your families together. There's no right to say, I'm going to take my spouse with me if I'm being sold to some other farm in some other region somewhere. Families were split up. Kids were taken away. Uh, slavery is horrific enough, but having to lose your spouse or your, your, your kids just simply because of an economic decision of a, a slave owner, pretty, uh, pretty barbaric stuff. Um, and that's why the chapter saddens me. What gives me hope, though, is aspirational hope is it was it was hugely wrong, but we had a civil war over it. We created the 13th Amendment, and the 14th Amendment, and the 15th Amendment, all related directly to ending the evils of slavery. And we, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, we've done things to correct the great wrongs of our history. And there are other great wrongs hopefully we'll still continue to address. But um you can't understand why some, maybe even some of the racial tensions we still have in this day, to this day in this country, are over perceived wrongs of history. And that's why we should study it on some uh, level. Yeah, so the Nate Turner Rebellion really, really after that clamps down. And any kind of, you know, sometimes slaves actually, there's, I think it was in a previous chapter, talked about how some of them had an expectation to work part of the day and then the rest of the day they were free. They could actually go out in the community to some degree. And they were more like an indentured servant than they were a slave. We know history changed that when these kind of uprisings and the number of slaves coming to the community are much higher. They can't have that sort of um, lax control. It becomes much more of a prison state after the Nate Turner um, revolt is so much put fear in the Southern slave culture that 
a lot of any suspicion of any kind of it would just result in death. And we know very few uh, whites were ever prosecuted for you couldn't do wrongdoing. It was property. It was like eh, if I if I kill a black person, I, I I killed a piece of my property or an animal. It's like killing an animal. Almost none of them were ever prosecuted. You know, and and, and white men certainly wouldn't be prosecuted for raping um, uh, a slave or or brutalizing a slave or killing a slave. But yet, if a black slave did any kind of wrongdoing their justice would be brought against them without due process of law and they'd either be killed or punished severely without right to testify or right to jury. And so um, the horrors of slavery went beyond just, you know, forced labor. It's, it's bigger than that. Um, we talked talk about women in the South, how they were treated very differently. Uh, they were expected to be put on a sort of pedestal of um, purity, for lack of a better way of saying it. They were to run the household, but they were often... Um, it's almost like the cult of womanhood and domestic domesticity down in the South was one of women's uh, sort of honor, uh, which was a little bit different than in the North, uh, especially in the plantations. But not everyone lived on a plantation. Only one in seven whites actually owned slaves in the South. Many of the whites down South never owned slaves at all, and they were often very poor. Um, but yet they defended the institution of slavery because they thought it was part of their cultural heritage in the community. I always found that to be an interesting phenomenon. Um, interesting chapter, a bit sad in some aspects, but what do we know during that era? That cotton changes the South and it changes the nation as a whole. It's just indirect in the other parts of the country. Um, number one export, number one part of the economy throughout the entire nation is cotton. And the book does suggest it's just Eli Whitney's um, cotton gin that changes the industry, but there were other um, processes that were being invented right around that same time maybe even some that were better than Eli Whitney, but it's like one of those times if you're the one that gets kind of the patent or the recognition, your name goes out to history and will be talked about forever. And if you're somebody that made even a better machine slightly later, um, not even trying to copy, but just on your own initiative, uh, you know, day late, a dollar short, and you don't get the recognition, but you know, technology was going to catch up to make that petite golf um, or um, type of cotton to become um, so very, very valuable. I'll leave you off with there. The book is very good. You don't need me to talk on and on and on and get little minor details, but it, you know, it's kind of a sad chapter, and uh, but yet an important one talking about the economy and how it started differentiating the North from the South. The South slavery is sanct sanctimonious. It's something that our lifeblood is through slavery. In the Northeast, although they're benefiting from it too because it's an economic boom through the, the financing, the manufacturer, and the, the middlemen of the Northeast are, are benefiting from it too, but they still see slavery as a... Um, an unnecessarily evil uh, institution that should end, even though they're benefiting it probably too through uh, the end product of economic viability and success. I'll leave you with that. Try not to be too negative, and I'll try to put up another video on uh, the next chapter in a couple of days.